They came as underdogs, but left as the most popular sporting team to ever visit Australia. As the nation tried to catch its breath after the remarkable tide test, it was thought that things could not possibly get better. But they did. Every test produced its own high drama. I remember hearing the crowd going, your captain, we should be off for some time. 70,103 people there, I think. Or well, there would have been at least 11 or 12 who didn't boo me. The Australian public's affection for the West Indies team was spontaneous and unique. The final test in Melbourne attracted a world record crowd. They all came off, there's no doubt about that. And the umpires are conferring at the moment. And when it was all over, a perpetual trophy was named in honour of the visiting captain. The first test in Brisbane had created history. It was the first ever tie in 83 years of test cricket. The feeling about the match, it, I know it was a wonderful game and it did lead to other great things. It might not have. There's no reason why the rest of that tour should have been so good. But it certainly did set up the tour and uh, it set up cricket in a different way. The Australian public realised how good the West Indians were. Uh, they were exciting to watch. The, the Australians, well, they more, I think they took us for granted a little bit, but by the same token that um, they, they picked the West Indians up as being fantastic to watch. And uh, it was an entertainment to go along and see a test match. Well, I think they were the underdogs, weren't they? And they did so well, and uh, the Australians do love supporting the underdogs. And, I think that helped immensely. I think the cricket was brilliant. Having a tie test, of course, set the tone. From that moment on, um, we were combatants, but we were, I don't know, there was, there was a, a, a real bond between the two teams. That, that goodwill, that love, that fellowship. You can play good cricket and still enjoy it. I think that test proved that. Not only did it bring cricket back, but it was also a game that made a lot of friendships. And, uh, not only in, like internally with your own players, but also, say, with the West Indians. The people, the umpiring, the cricketers, all got caught up in a series that began with a tie test and set the stage for a very beautiful series of cricket. Those were the days, too, when, when cricket was more or less dying in Australia, from what I remember. And, and this first test match, brought everything back to life. And um, there were two fantastic captains, both playing a, uh, positive cricket. We'd become sort of static with Test cricket. And all of a sudden, the West Indies had revitalised it. And as I say, that takes two to tango, and I think that's where Benno and Worrell jointly should be given the, the, the thing. Not, it wasn't just the West Indies that brought it back. I think Benno and Worrell as captains did it. Frank Worrell and Richie Benno toss in near-century Melbourne heat prior to the start of the second test match. A good first-day crowd of 32,000 waits for play to start, no doubt hoping for a repetition of the sensational first test in Brisbane. Any hopes the West Indies had of building on their fine showing in Brisbane was slowly extinguished in the Melbourne heat by some solid Australian batting. Harvey is on the lookout for runs and at this stage looks to be in no trouble against the opening attack. Simpson has played an extremely useful innings for his side, treating every ball on its merits. Despite the loss of early wickets, the Australians managed to score at nearly a run a minute. The Australian 150 is past 40 minutes after lunch, but in Worrell's next over there's further trouble for Australia when O'Neill glances and Sobers takes a magnificent catch at leg slip. A great effort by this versatile cricketer, and Australia now in trouble with four down for 155, some spirited batting by test debutant Johnny Martin pushed Australia's total past 300. And when Worrell comes on again, Martin hits him for a towering six to bring up the Australian 300. The Melbourne crowd has taken Johnny Martin to its heart. 
Chasing 348, the West Indies was soon in trouble. Once again, Alan Davidson was the destroyer. A faint touch and the West Indies have lost their first wicket. Davidson is bowling with plenty of life, but Kanai is in brilliant form and his fluent off drive brings him another three runs. Kanai's superb 84 was not enough. The West Indies innings crumbled. Wes Hall is next in, and much to the delight of everyone, he wastes no time in cracking Davidson through the slips for a speedily run three. However, some comic relief was once again provided by Wesley Hall. Now let's watch Wesley Hall, the crowd pleaser, as he faces Benno. When Hall's batting, there's always something doing, whether it's running between wickets, an exaggerated defensive stroke, or an appeal for LBW. There's no doubting the popularity of Wesley Hall. And this seems to apply equally to the players as well as to the cricketing public. A huge swing and then bowled neck and crop by Davidson with Martin smartly catching the ball. West Indies all out 181, 167 behind and Alan Davidson taking the bowling honours with a splendid 6 to 53. Benno applies the follow on and Hunt and Solomon are the opening batsmen for the second time. After a 10 minute spell, Davidson begins bowling again and the innings begins with a most inauspicious stroke from Conrad Hunt. Early on in the West Indies' second innings, there was a rather unfortunate occurrence that became known as the Joe Solomon cap incident. But when Solomon faces Benno, the West Indians are to suffer a bitter blow. Before completing his stroke, Solomon loses his cap which, which dislodges the bales and on appeal he's given out by umpire Hoy, hit wicket. My cap fell on the wicket, and this is a slow bowler, he's not a fast bowler, he's ducking for a bounce. Slow bowler, playing back, and the cap just fell off in the stump. We all knew that he was out. I mean, there was no hesitation in the West Indies camp by the West Indies players, because it's a part of the rules of cricket. It really was quite interesting. I remember hearing the crowd booing uh, your captain, Richard Bruno, for some time, which is quite unusual. Uh, 70,103 people there, I think. And uh, there were, or well, there would have been at least 11 or 12 who didn't boo me that day. Joey walked off and then suddenly the, the crowd is uh, really booing Richie, which was totally unfair. And it was a very tough call for him, I think, then, because there was no way he could recall the batsman. The man was out legitimately, so it was a clear-cut decision. But the crowd didn't like it the games had gone so well and the relationship between the teams and the Australian people was such that they thought probably at the time that Richie should not have appealed or the team should not have appealed. I think it was a measure of how much uh, the West Indians on the fine world had begun to win the respect and admiration of the Australian crowd and therefore technically and legally Joe Solomon really was out but they saw it understandably as not quite sportsmanlike and it's a part of the rules and you have to appeal otherwise you're not play keeping within the laws of the game. I can understand the Melbourne public being a little bit a bit upset about it because uh, you know the West Indies team was so popular. I think it was emotional, I think it was the fact that they were beginning to be on our side and they saw the way we played cricket Brown, Don, Sir Donald Brown himself said we put the sea back into cricket and I think it was beginning to show and that's why they supported us against their captain Richard Benoit. It's quite a remarkable thing. <laughs> Hunt is now rapidly approaching his century and it comes in Misson's next over when he brilliantly hooks the first ball for four. Hunt's hundred is scored in 243 minutes and includes eight fours and it takes the West Indies total to five for 167, saving the innings defeat. Australia went on to win the second test by the comfortable margin of seven wickets. And with the scoreboard showing Australia three for 66, the scores are level, and now here's the winning stroke as Wesley Hall bowls to Les Favell. He cuts him down the gully, and the hallowed turf of the Melbourne cricket ground is ravaged by the invader. The way the Australian crowds embraced this team of West Indian cricketers had considerable social significance, given that it occurred in an era when the White Australia policy was still in existence. Under this policy, 
People with coloured skin were not permitted to immigrate and settle in Australia. Entry was restricted to working and or studying for a period not exceeding five years. It was never talked about. We knew that they had to pass certain regulation changes for us to go there and to be um, admitted on a par with everybody else. Um, and I think this must also have impinged on Frank in his thinking. And that is why I think he was so insistent that we deserve and merited the, pre the appreciation and the response, positive response of Australian people. We, we had heard about the the white Australian policy, and um, when we got there, we, 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 we knew it was there. To me personally, um, you know, racism to me has always been not, it was really a social construction and not a biological reality. I say so because my grandfather was white. I mean, whether you believe it or not, he's from Scotland. And therefore, you know, I've been uh, accustomed to sitting down in the lap of an old white guy with blue eyes and calling me, come on, my grandson. I mean, that is not the norm in the West Indies. So personally, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I could never fathom it, to be honest. It, it, it offended me <clears throat> personally. The people are people, regardless of the color of their skin. And I've always looked at life in that light. What happens, the more you mix with people, the more you get to understand people, the better it would be. There was an occasion when we were in actual fact invited for lunch by um, a lady and three of us went to lunch and she informed us that really and truly um, it was because we were uh, VIP cricketers that she would have us in our house but she would not have um, the, the, um, Aboriginal. Aboriginals in our house, or, or normally black people in our house, because um, this was not the way she was brought up and she would not feel comfortable like her. I'm not responsible for the color of my skin, you're not responsible for the color of your skin. We're just human people, and if you can behave and relate to me, and I can do the same thing, we, there's not, 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 nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. And this is one of cricket's most powerful forces, isn't it? I think so. I think so. I think so. The issue of the White Australia policy was even raised in conversation with the Prime Minister of the day, Sir Robert Menzies. We had this um, function and, um, you know, he came and he spoke with me and uh, we exchanged pleasantries. And uh, he asked me um, whether, um, how I like Australia. And I gave him a, a very honest answer. I loved it. He says, how were you doing in Brisbane? I said, marvellous. Any complaints? I said, none whatsoever. But is there anything that you don't like about this country or any of policies or anything that we have? And I, you know, that was outside the Austin. So I was, you know, as a prime minister you're talking to, so you're pretty guarded. Um, and I said, oh, um, not really. I, I think that I'm okay and he asked me three to four times and I said since you're very persistent sir I just want to tell you that um, I, I really don't understand your, your white Australian policy because simply um, you know we love this place so much but my brother um, who is only a year older than me better educated he's a nicer guy I know that I'm sorry, you know, it's hard for me to say that, but that's the way it is. And you're not going to have him, but you'll have me because I can play cricket. And um, that, to my mind, and I, I wasn't too um, impressed with, especially since I had this whole business of my, uh, you know, my genes. My, my, my grandfather come from Scotland. So I said it isn't apparent because in two generations you can go for, you can go for full circle. There's no doubt about that. And um, he... He took it very gentlemanly, as I would expect. He, he, he definitely took it very well. He says, oh, I see, I just want to know. They didn't look at the colour of the skins. The Australian public loved the West Indians because of the way they played cricket. And they're obviously gentlemen. So uh, Frank Worrell picked that up and uh, he realised that they were loved. And uh, I think the emotion got to him. From the very beginning, we had no doubt at all that the Australian people want us to be there. And especially as we started to play the solo cricket, we started to play. And I personally, and I know that none of our players ever ran at any difficulty at all throughout our stay in Australia during that 66-1 tour. The Sydney Cricket Ground, as Australia's captain Richie Benno leads his team onto the field before the start of the third test match. Benno lost the toss and the West Indian captain Frank Worrell decided to bat on a moist pitch. The opening pair is Cammy Smith on the left and Conrad Hunt. 
It's a hot, steamy morning and a large crowd sees Davidson open the bowling to hunt. And what a start it is. A crashing shot and the West Indians have begun their innings in spectacular fashion. Yes, it's a boundary. Four runs off the first ball. On and off the field, we had had a magnificent relationship between the players and the Australian people. Wherever we went, we were loved. The Australian public certainly loved watching Garfield Sobers in full flight. He delighted the crowd with another blazing century. 37,000 ready to cheer as Davidson bowls. and they really attracted the people and did more for cricket um, than, than any other side as basically has ever done. I was bowling to Sobers with the second new ball and he, I'd bowled him a, a slower ball about three balls beforehand and he, he didn't pick it up very quickly. So I thought I'd, I'd give him another one. He sort of pushed forward to uh, make a slower ball and obviously didn't get to the pitch. And he'd had me completely beaten on the front foot. And there and then I just thought quickly, well, if I'm going to be out, I'm going to be make sure that it's going to be a very high catch. And whoever gets on it is going to be circling it for a while and give me a 50-50 chance. Sabres was, was, went to go forward changed his mind for some reason, went back and the ball disappeared over the mid-on boundary for six, off the back foot. Now, that is quite an exceptional shot. <laughs> and uh, it's the only time I've ever seen done, actually, uh, something like that. And I think it finished in the, uh, the door behind the bowler's arm into a little pub. If you beat a great player, I think that is good enough. But when he comes back on the back foot, and, and, and hit you over long off for six. I mean, that's something else. But as Sobers came up to me, I said, oh, thanks very much. And he looked at me and he said, bloody good shot. He says, but why did you have to do it to me? <laughs> and I, I remember replying to him, well, Ian, it was either you or I. So I had to take the chance. <laughs> I remember Davo saying to me afterwards, he said, you just stuffed up the new ball beautifully, didn't you? When it was Australia's turn at the crease, the spin of veteran Alf Valentine and newcomer Lance Gibbs turned the game in favour of the West Indies. Mackay is in trouble, facing the ball turning from the leg and Gibbs takes full advantage. And he's out, caught by Solomon at slip. Mackay scored 39 valuable runs and Australia has lost seven wickets for 200 runs as Gibbs bowls to Martin. A snick and Martin is out, caught Solomon without scoring. A fine performance by Gibbs, who took two wickets in two balls. It's the end of the over and Gibbs is on the hat-trick. Of the wickets in Australia, Sydney seemed to be the one that would help you more as a spinner. Gibbs was extremely good. Um, he turned the ball probably more than any other off-spinner that I've played against. Very accurate, got bounce. And uh, it was quite difficult to get down the wicket to, to, to attack. And, uh, you know, when you've got all those uh, attributes, you've got to be a pretty fair bowler. In the grandstand, Australian selectors Sir Donald Bradman and Dudley Seddon watch Gibbs come into bowl. Benno drives and he's avoided the hat trick. A single and Gibbs bowls to Grout. A faulty drive goes straight to mid-on where Conrad Hunt snaps up the catch. They were planning to send... Lance back home because he pulled this leg muscle on it. But we had a monsieur on tour, um, Manny Howells, and he worked on Lance, worked on him until he got that leg back. So Donald had said that off spinners are not very successful in Australia and there's no sense keeping Gibbs here. <laughs> I, I heard that and immediately I got fit. <laughs> It's a startling collapse, and Valentine deals the final blow when Benno plays the ball straight back to the bowler. Australia lost her last four wickets for two runs in a sudden collapse, and full credit to spinners Valentine and Gibbs, who finished with seven wickets between them. 
The West Indies led by 137 runs on the first innings. Alan Davidson bowled Australia back into the game by taking three quick wickets. The highlight of the day comes with the next ball. Davidson comes in at full speed. Sobers plays and there's a loud appeal from the whole Australian team. Sobers stands his ground, then realises he's out, caught behind by Grubb. Frank Worrell came to the rescue, playing a great captain's knock. The run getting rate gets faster when Martin bowls to Worrell. A short ball is hit right out of the ground by Worrell. One of the most astounding memories that I have of this game. Frank Worrell drove Davidson through the covers for four and no one moved but everyone in the ground stood up and applauded. It'd take all the technical perfections that can be created in any one shot at any one time in any sport and that was to me was, was this cover drive he played in Sydney and I thought gosh that was some shot. And I remember Jerry Gomez our manager screaming in our dressing room because we had never seen a more beautiful shot. One shot for four. And he remember looking out at the, 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 the crowds and he says, OK, you can go home now, you've seen it all. Australia's chances of victory were dealt a cruel blow when match winner Alan Davidson suffered an injury. He had three for 33 in the West Indian second innings, then did a hamstring. And I can remember running in and um, and I, I wasn't bowling too bad, but I, I, every time I tried to get up on my front foot, it was because of my, my front leg that I'd done it on. And every time I went up onto my toe to do it, well, I used to get this sharp pain. Um, and it was pretty, pretty hurtful. Australia's other opening bowler, Ian Meckiff, injured his back and was also unable to bowl. The new ball is taken by Mackay from the northern end. Alexander cracks the ball away for a single and the score continues to climb. And then the game takes an unusual turn with the sight of Benno bowling medium pace seamers with the new ball. It's the only solution to Australia's bowling problem and Alexander takes advantage. In the next Mackay over, Alexander provides excitement when this tremendous hit sends the ball soaring high into the grandstand. He went in at seven and, and yet really he should have been batting perhaps at five even. You know, but he was, he was good enough to bat higher in the list. And, um, and, and he was such a, a fighter too. He was a, he was a real dour sort of fighter as well. He, he had a ton of motor. Benno is the bowler and Alexander really crashes the ball through the field and that's his century. <laughs> Alexander has scored his first hundred in test cricket, a great performance. Yes, indeed. Um, I made 108 the first time I'd made three figures in a first-class match um, and it occurred in the second innings. Um, fortunately, as Lance and others have reminded me, if they hadn't stayed at the wicket, I would never have done it. Australia's task of scoring 464 runs in nine hours began to look possible thanks to superb batting by Norm O'Neill and Neil Harvey. Harvey passes his 50 to become the first player to score a thousand runs in test matches between Australia and the West Indies. The score passes the hundred in an exciting period of play. Paul is bowling in the last minutes of play and the last balls fly over O'Neill's head. The batsmen have added 90 runs in less than even time. This is the second last over and Harvey takes a single to give O'Neill the chance to get 50 before stumps. And O'Neill makes no mistake. At Stumps, Australia has 282 runs to get, with Harvey 84 and O'Neill 53. I was batting with Norm O'Neill and we had a good partnership going. And being 84, I was a little bit stiff in the morning and uh, instead of having a, a loosen up or a rub uh, from the masseur, I gave it a miss. The final day of the third test match in Sydney. Australia's batting and Richie Benno is called onto the field after Neil Harvey injured a leg muscle attempting a run.
in the very first over, Lance Gibbs was bowling at the time, and I pushed one into the covers to Gary Sobers, and I went through for a quick single, and just got within a yard up the other end, and my hamstring went twang, and uh, had finished me for the game. I just couldn't stand on it. Harvey drives without getting to the pitch of the ball, and he's out, caught in the covers for a grand 85. It was a great catch by Sobers, and the West Indians have broken the vital partnership. Valentine bowls to O'Neill, who now carries a heavy responsibility. If he fails, then Australia's hopes will slump with him. Three runs to O'Neill, and Australia requires 268 more with seven wickets left. When O'Neill's fighting innings ended on 70, victory was in sight for the West Indies. This is the last ball of the match. Davidson is bowled for one, and the West Indians have scored a great victory by 222 runs. I think that the people in Australia began to say, hey, we've got a good series on our hands. The, the tie test as well as the, the win at Sydney had lifted the team. And we, I think we performed even better as, as we went on. If we continue playing the way in which we have played, we've got a very good chance of winning this series. And, and, and that's what we always went up there with that kind of motivation, that we could win. And although Australia, when we first went there, was so strong, we now find that we were beginning to become a team to reckon with. The youngest ever president of the United States of America takes the oath of office and sets out his vision for the new frontier of the 1960s. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. A few days later, the teams gather in Adelaide for the vital fourth test. The series locked at one test all. Four tends to be inaccurate in his opening over and Hunt punishes anything loose getting four from this square drive. High on confidence, the West Indies fielded an unchanged side. Decimated by injury, the Australians were without senior batsman Neil Harvey, the spearhead of the Australian attack Alan Davidson, and his new ball partner Ian Meckiff. From my point of view, it was, uh, was a very downcast feeling because I'd lost Davo. And uh, this, was a, this was a real problem. And uh, the man who'd taken all these West Indian wickets was suddenly not going to be there. The other thing that happened, of course, is we lost the toss. It was 107 degrees in Adelaide, and it's uh, 9 o'clock at night. It was still 104 degrees, so it was pretty uh, warm. The blazing century heat was matched by a rampant Rowan Kanhai. When you have a good player like Rohan, he's in the top drawer, you know. Uh, and he made it look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> But there's no doubt at all about Kanhai's classical cover drive straight to the boundary, and when it's followed by a well-executed square cut, it seems as though this is going to be Kanhai's day. He's in full flight on the Adelaide Oval with its short sides, and uh, he'd already worked out what a good idea it was to be able to play uh, a double cow shot and hit it in the middle of the bat and send it over the Victor Richardson gates. When Richie Benno comes on to bowl for the first time, it's all the same to Kanhai as he swings him high over square leg for the first six of the match. It was a, the Western new way of life. I mean, we played attractive cricket, we entertained, and uh, at the same time, we individually we performed, and, uh, and that is where we, uh, I thought uh, I was taught how to play the game. When Benno bowls again, the avalanche continues as Kanhai unfolds some superb off drives and helps himself to 11 runs. He's technically a wonderful batsman. He always looked uh, as though he wouldn't get out. He had a great technique. He's very quick on his feet, very sharp. And my lasting memory of his innings in uh, Adelaide is falling over time and time again where he's trying to uh, sweep and still hitting the ball for four or six <laughs> from halfway on the ground. Uh, great, great eye. And when fast bowler Hall bowls to Kanhai, he suffers the indignity of being hit high over mid-wicket for six. The second time in this innings, Kanai has hit an Australian bowler over the fence. West Indies cricket needed something, and that series had helped us um, to sort of uh, come out of our shell and entertain a little bit more. Plus the fact that the series had taught us how to be hard and 
uh, high professionals because we were playing against a team that were renowned with great players. Kanhai's century seems inevitable and it comes when he on drives Klein for three. Kanhai's <laughs> innings has been a crowd pleasing affair and his blazing hundred has matched Adelaide's century heat. I mean, we played hard cricket in the middle and the camaraderie off the field was uh, fantastic. We were in the same hotels and it was common to see the Australians and West Indies at the bar having a drink together, having meals together. Even any private parties we went to, the Australians would be there, the West Indies would be there. Uh, it, was, it was great. I mean, we played it tough on the field, but we were gentlemen, as we should be, off the field. There is something greater than the game. That is the goodwill between the two countries, the camaraderie between the two teams. It's no exaggeration to say that when Hall's there, there's always something doing. And for proof, watch this. Yes, it's all in a day's work for Wesley Hall. The spirit was fantastic. We spent a lot of social time with them. Uh, there was very hard, tough cricket out in the field, but uh, the good spirit was always prevalent. The third day's play begins with an impressive ceremony to mark Australia Day, honouring the country's 173rd birthday. And when the West Indies team takes the field, conditions are the most pleasant for the test so far. Wesley Hall's limbering up includes some ballet exercises. For the big crowd on the holiday Monday, the Australia Day celebrations were spoiled, first by Hall. Then Lance Gibbs once again turned the game in favour of the West Indies. Lance Gibbs begins a devastating and historic piece of bowling. Mackay is out LBW to Gibbs for 29 and the Australian total 6 for 281 with Grout the new batsman. Gibbs bowls his next ball to Grout. Grout edges and Sobers takes the catch at leg slip. Australia 7 for 281 and Frank Misson interface a hat. I realised that Frank Misson coming in is going to push down the line, bat and pad. So I bowled a little seam up, quickly, zoom. And it was through him like a flash. Well, not expecting that. Lance Gibbs has taken the first ever hat trick in Australia West Indies Test match. A triumphant moment for the young off spinner. And the Australian captain is on hand with his congratulations too. There was no great excitement from me at the non-strikers end. I was uh, pretty cranky about the whole thing, not being able to have a part of it and uh, then got caught off Lance out at Long On. There's plenty of excitement around the ground but you tend to lose yourself if you're out in the centre. You don't get too excited about that sort of thing but uh, the people who were actually at the ground uh, paid their money to come in and they knew they were part of history. Going in after Australia had been dismissed, people were coming and hugging me and things of this nature. So that is when it started to really take effect. When the West Indies batted again, Rowan Kanhai picked up exactly where he left off in the first innings. Kanhai makes great speed towards his second century of the match, scoring freely off Misson. This flashing cover drive by Kanhai, another boundary takes his aggregate for this tour of Australia to over 1,000 runs. A thousand runs which have given pleasure to hundreds of thousands of Australian cricket lovers. Kanhai's now on 99, anxious for that vital single, but he doesn't connect every time. So he came to me and we had a little discussion and we said, look, you just got to play the ball straight back down the wicket. I mean, to the other side, just short. I'll come through and get your hundred. Benno brings three fieldsmen in close on the onside to cut off the short single, but Kanhai can't resist the temptation and a brilliant piece of work by Misson runs Hunt out by inches. Hunt foolishly run out to 79 and the West Indies 2 for 229. A wonderful partnership of 163 between Hunt and Kanai. And Kanai is obviously greatly affected by the foolish mistake. It was sad because, you know, he was batting so well. And it was a good partnership at that time. And, and although we, uh, we planned to run whatever happened, I mean, I think it, it was a little bit too close at the time and it proven that way. I was trying to get Rohan to keep focus and carry on and therefore looking at him and trying to get him focused, I didn't see I was going the opposite direction to the dressing room. 
it was the most embarrassing moment of my life as well. <laughs> but for the sake of the team, it was okay. Can I second century for the match comes when he square cuts four for four. A wonderful achievement by the audacious little man from British Guiana. A feat achieved only once before in Australia West Indies test matches by Clyde Walcott. And the Australians are generous in their tributes to Kanhai. You don't make two hundreds in a test match, a hundred in each and in a test match every day. And it was a special day for me when that happened. Benno bowls again, Kanhai attempts to pull him for four, is struck on the pads and given out LBW by umpire Hoy. What a great double by Rowan Kanhai, 117 and 115. I was a great autograph collector of me. I didn't know what happened to my autographs, books now. But, and I used to, all the old cricketers them, I used to go and sit down and listen to them. Of course, one of the old cricketers you spent some time with was Sir Donald Bradman? Yes, Sir Donald, yeah, I used to go and sit with him. And I remember, my little autograph book, I say I have a page here. I want Sir Donald on one side and I want his wife on the other side. And I got his, but she had gone for something. And I was in the dressing room and he came and get the book from me. And took it to his wife and got it autographed and bring back to me. Sir Donald, them guys couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. Like one of the, the world's greatest batsmen. I have the time to come up to a little guy from Jamaica to get his autograph. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was something else. Finally, with three quarters of an hour to stumps, Worrell declares the West Indies innings closed at six for 432 and giving Australia the virtually impossible task of scoring 460 to win in 395 minutes. Favell gets an edge and Alexander's magnificent diving catch starts the Australian collapse. And Sobers bowls again in what's to prove a tragic over for Australia. O'Neill and McDonald move off for the single, but Kanhai's superb throw runs McDonald out. McDonald is out for two, and Australia two for seven in real trouble. Hall bowls the last ball of the day. Simpson edges, and Alexander takes his second catch. Simpson out for three, and the Australian total three for 31, with O'Neill 21 not out after a sensational last half hour before stumps on the fourth day. When it came to Adelaide um, and the situation that ensued after the fourth day, um, we really did feel we were in with a, a big chance. But I must tell you, you know, that um, one of the delightful experiences of our lives is Jackie Hendricks and myself, you know, we were that day invited that night actually to Sir Donald's home for dinner. That was one of my abiding um, pleasures of the whole tour, the, the, the being, being so close to Sir Donald Bradman and, um, you know, hearing him talk about the cricket and, 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 and analyse it. And um, it had a great, great effect on me. And at the end, when we were leaving, we turned to the Don and he says, well, we look as though we got you tomorrow, Don, Sir Don. And he looked at us and he says, um, yeah, he looks that way. But if ever there was an occasion for Mackay, it's tomorrow. Australia 5 for 129, and the duo Mackay, a great man for this situation, is to partner Benno. Mackay's almost out immediately when he edges to leg slip, and Gibbs almost makes a catch. It's to prove a costly let-off as far as the West Indies are concerned, as the imperturbable Mackay's innings is soon underway. Slasher would go down probably as one of the best team players I've ever played with. You could ask Slasher to go out and try and make 50 in 50 minutes. He'd do it, which is against his style of play. Or else you could ask him to go out there and say, I want you to stick around for four hours and make 10. That was his style of play. He could do that. Gibbs bowls, and again Mackay fails to make contact, but Alexander's beaten two, and there are two buys. Ken Mackay has the reputation of being the world's best judge of whether a ball is going to pass outside his stumps, and in this innings, he gets plenty of opportunities to test his judgment. We've all seen uh, shots of Slasher leaving the ball go when it's going two inches past the off stump, as it was in those days, just a, a centimetre or two nowadays. And he did that, I can't ever recall Slasher being bold, uh, not playing a shot. He just had wonderful judgment. Worrell himself comes back into the attack for what's to prove a sensational spell. Grout is beaten, and the confident appeal for LBW is upheld. Grout out for a well-made 42 in 76 minutes, 
And when the players leave the field for tea, the Australian score is 7 for 203, still two hours to bat, and only bowlers Misson, Hoare and Klein to come in. Well, Norm O'Neill and Johnny Martin took me out for some practice in the nets, and, and they bowled to me for about 20 minutes, and I was bowled eight to ten times. And I'm playing at balls that I thought were going to turn, and they went straight, and balls that went straight, and they turned. And, and there was a woman standing behind the nets, and she said, well, it's a waste of time sending you in, isn't it? Well, I couldn't disagree with her the way I was batting. After tea, when Sobers bowls, Mackay has a few uncomfortable moments, but nevertheless, he's doing a typically sterling job for Australia. Hoare's innings comes to a sudden end, clean bowled without scoring. The Australian scoreboard now shows 9 for 207, and in a devastating burst, Worrell has taken 3 for 8. And we lost three quick wickets, and I padded up, and the boys were packing their, their bags to go home. And uh, didn't give you very much confidence. And I said, well, away you go. I don't want to see you until the end of the game. Yeah, yeah, right. I walked down the stairs, and, the, and uh, one of the members said, laughed out and said, ho, 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 it, it's all up to you now. And the whole stand started to laugh. You know, so. When Victorian spinner Lindsay Klein makes his way to the wicket and smiles ruefully at the West Indies fieldsman, there are over a hundred minutes scheduled to stumps. And with fieldsmen all round him, Klein sets about a task generally conceded as utterly hopeless. I seem to recall it was about, I think, 20 past four in the afternoon when, when, when um, Klein went out to bat. And of course, we were all started to, to prepare to leave, you know, pack your bags and whatever you had to do because another 10 minutes and it would be all over. Klein safely threw his first over. When you look at the, the record of Lindsay Klein, you know, we figured, well, we home and dry. At the time, you didn't have any worries. Whatever happened, you figured that you were going to win this game because you couldn't see Mackay and Klein batting for 90-odd minutes. And with Sobers at the other end, Mackay defends to perfection. I could, I could imagine Slash and Mackay batting out, but I couldn't imagine Lindsay Klein batting uh, that period of time. For a period, Klein has a good deal of the strike against both Sobers and Worrell, but with the minutes ticking away, the attack is repulsed. I remember feeling as far as from here to you, because things at once there start to get very desperate, and we really had to try and put some pressure on. I remember Frank bringing me into Silly Midoff, and I was really under the bat. Gaining confidence with each ball he faces, Worrell's next over sees Klein open his account with a single to mid-on, and in this same over we see the disputed catch with Worrell bowling to Mackay. Mackay forward, Sobers takes the ball and the West Indies players start to leave the field. But umpire Eager remains unmoved and Sobers is bitterly disappointed at his decision that it was a bump ball. And there was no doubt in all of our minds that it was a clean catch, there was no doubt. We were so convinced it was a perfect catch that we all left the field. We didn't even appear. So when nothing happened and Slasher stayed there, we thought, what's up? So we said, Mr. Umpire, how's that? He said, not out. I remember we started to blow our tops about it. And Frank says, come on, quiet down. The umpire says, not out, and it's not out. That is the position it is in. Frank was very quick to say, fellas, come back, back, back into position, back into position. You know, um, there was no rancor about it. He said, gentlemen, if you get a bad decision and you show some sort of feeling about it, the crowd will say, oh, he got a bad decision, but he's a bad sportsman, and they'll turn against you. So whatever happens at this store, every bad decision, any bad decision, I want you to have no, show no dissent of any kind. No, Slasher was certain that it was a bump ball. Yes, no, I thought it was a bump ball. Yeah, we were square on, as you understand, in Adelaide, and we had a perfect view of the actual flight of the ball and everything. And it never, ever occurred to us that it was a catch. And it didn't occur to Slasher or... I think what happened with the West Indies, they hoped. Klein doesn't middle every ball, but who'd expect him to in this electric atmosphere with 13,000 spectators and a million more listening and watching, wondering which ball will end the test match. Slasher gave me a lot of confidence. He believed that I, I could bat defensively, and uh, he did say that to me. 
With just over an hour to go to stumps, Worrell gives Hall the new ball, and with Lindsay Klein to face the giant speedster, every cricket heart, including the West Indies players, is in its owner's mouth. Let's watch and see how Klein fares. First, a no ball from Hall. I didn't bowl any bouncers. I was criticised uh, for not bowling him any bouncers, but I so often seen batsmen um, who were very capable of being struck in the head and things like that. And I didn't think that um, to bowl a bouncer to Klein was the thing to do, so I kept the ball up. The match almost ends with a run out when Klein thinks about a single and has to scurry back. It would still be the, 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 that moment of anguish when you hit a, a batsman that couldn't defend himself. In fact, until that day, or until that 90 minutes, I thought he couldn't defend himself. Now, I, I, I learned very painfully that he could. But it's Klein's day, and he plays Hall with greater aplomb than some of his more illustrious teammates, richly earning the drink that follows Hall's over. We started to get excited about 10 minutes into the last hour. I started to think, well, God, this is possible. They've batted for about an hour, they've gone through a new ball. I sat there with Shirley Bradman through the whole of that last session and, and she's crying her eyes out on my shoulder and, and saying, can we save it, Alan, can we save it? And I said, yeah, sure we can save it, sure we can save it. And indirectly I was saying, well, no, we can't in, <laughs> underneath it all. Gibbs is the next bowler tried and Mackay has mixed fortunes. But when he turns the off spinner to mid-wicket for a single, he shows he has increasing faith in his partner's ability to keep the attack at bay. When I, when I became quite nervous was when we had about 20 minutes to go. And then I looked at the clock and I thought, gee, we've come a fair way now and, you know, I might get through. And that's when I got a little tense, yes. We started to, to count because the clock at the Adelaide Oval goes down very fast on the right hand side when it's getting down to the half hour and it goes up very slowly and it, it still does. In the dressing room it was almost unbearable, the old sweaty hands being forced to sit in the one seat, players who smoked were puffing away and it just gained I think an atmosphere in the dressing room for tension I've never ever seen uh, or before or since. We started to get edgy and we were very edgy towards the end, I can tell you. There was as much shouting coming from the dressing room as each ball was negotiated as there was from the members who normally don't shout about anything. Australia still with this last wicket intact. Klein not out 15, Mackay not out 62. And Great Scott, what are we going to call this for a field? The whole side's gathered round Klein. There's a, there's a row of four blokes on the onside. There's a row of five on the offside. What a fantastic sight this is. No hope of telling you what this field is. The whole West Indies side is within about four yards of Klein's bat. When we had the 11, when I had 11 players within a, you know, a metre or two, um, I looked at the, the wicket and there was a piece of um, turf on it and I, I thought I'd go up and move it. And uh, Al Valentine um, helped me out. He took off his cap and swept the wicket. So uh, I didn't, sa didn't save any time at all. And now Worrell bowls the second last over of the match to Klein with every fieldsman except the bowler clustered round Klein's bat. It's the end of Worrell's over and Klein's made it. At one minute to six, Frank Worrell threw the ball to his lion-hearted fast bowler, Wesley Hall, and prayed for a miracle. I don't think Slash's uh, stomach was settled because he was he had to face that last ball. But I, I was more settled because I'd done my job and, and played the second last over. And, and I was just uh, willing him on to get through that last over. The last ball of the fourth test match as Hall comes in. No, he misses his step. He overran the crease and he chucks the ball into the turf in annoyance. <laughs> and here it comes, the last ball of the fourth test match, and Hall comes in and bowls now, no ball! A no ball! A no ball! And 20,000 children have rushed onto the Adelaide Oval. And they've all got to get off again. So Frank, um, he said, well, you know, where's you, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to give it all. I've got, I'm going to blow 
Makai away with this one, you know. I, you've got to convince yourself you can do it. <laughs> I thought that a good bumper would be the ideal thing. I had men all around the wicket. The least perturbed of anybody, Kenny Mackay, as he gets in over the bat again, and here it comes. This is the last ball, and Hall bowls it, and Mackay's hit high up in the body. It's all over. It's a drop. It's a drop. It's all over. Australia draws the fourth test match. I can still uh, have this wonderful uh, mental image of Slasher putting his arms above his uh, his head, the bat held high and allowing it to uh, hit him in the ribs and uh, that takes a lot of cold courage to be hit when you're trying to avoid this is acceptable but when you've got to do that uh, for, the, you know, for your team that, that's a huge contribution. Slasher took it in the middle of his stomach and then bit on his gum. <laughs> I walked off. The next day he showed it to me. It, it had taken a, a, a bit of a walk around. He was around the, the black and blue mark was nearly in, the, in his back by that time. Could easily have had a broken rib from it. It was so bruised and uh, it got him in a nasty spot. But um, he didn't say much when, uh, when he came off. He just went and sat down. He was obviously in a bit of pain. But um, just sat down. I said to him, well done. Thanks, matey, sir. And that was it. Oh, a very special moment, you know. I didn't, uh, I don't think we said much. We just uh, put our arm around each other and um, and had that wonderful feeling that we, we did something special for the team. Yeah. Then to go in the dressing room and heard that Norman O'Neill had bowled down Lindsay Klein about four times in about six balls in the nets, you start to wonder where, where were our strengths? <laughs> I think that um, it was probably the the most exciting time of my life with regards to that tie test and also the draw and it's what it wasn't I was picked as a bowler but I didn't uh, wasn't remembered as a bowler in those test matches we had our chances to get him out he batted they batted for 108 minutes and if you as a side can't get a, the last man out on that time well then Cricket is the only game in which you may not be in a position to win, but you don't have to lose. And Mackay showed it that day. And I think that we thought it was a good game. We should have won it. But, um, you know, two men batted for 90 minutes, so we just couldn't get them out. And we decided, as Frank said, let us refocus. You know, let us go to Melbourne, feeling that we could win. Because you must remember, the series was still one off.